a few years back, uh, seven years back, in fact, uh, myself, my eldest son, Luke, who's now 20, 13 at the time, makes sense, doesn't it, with the maths, we decided to walk the Pembrokeshire Coast Path from Pennine Sands uh, all the way around the Pembrokeshire Coast to Dog F, uh, not to Dog F, sorry, to St Dog Mules. 186 miles in length. I'd say we agreed. Um, it was more of a persuasion on my part, uh, sort of uh, over the years, uh, Luke, Dad's always wanted to do this and no one will do it with me. A promise of sweets and long conversations with his dad. Um, promise of meals and nice nights in hotels along the way, uh, which didn't always materialise. And uh, one weekend we were doing the section around Milford Haven. Not the most inspiring of sections, but uh, still we were, we were doing that section. And the forecast was boiling. The forecast to the head was, um, was, uh, was hot weather, reaching into the late 20s or early 30s. And to me that was like, whoa, that's steaming weather. So I, I packed well prepared as a, as a dad does uh, with lots of bottles of water. My rucksack was bursting with water. And as the, as the morning, of, as we walked through the morning, it got hotter and hotter and hotter. And we drank more and more and more. And in my mind, uh, I, I knew that the bottles of water were getting less. And, and virtually by lunch, lunchtime, the water had run out. Um, and my concerns started to, uh, to grow. And I, I remember a couple of low points on that walk. Uh, we found a little spot to have our lunch. A little tiny tree gave us a bit of shade. And we were both huddled into this tree. And suddenly out of my rucksack, uh, Luke had, had, had put in the rucksack before we left, the, uh, the book of pointless the facts of pointless he loved facts he still does and uh, he decided then to start to work through all these part of these facts with me uh, one by one and ask me questions and and i was not interested i feared it was to look he didn't notice but you know i didn't want to be asked questions i was worried about what was going to happen this afternoon and also there was a real low point uh, which i'm not proud of now and uh, uh, luke had a pair of trainers on and i had a pair of sweaty smelly walking boots and my feet were steaming they were sore and swelling you know usual sort of stuff and i asked him to swap and you could see luke looking at me and looking at my feet and looking at his trainers and the answer was no quite rightly so oh boy did i ever grump on you see the situation our physical situation that day started to affect my insides my emotional uh, situation, especially you say my soul God, started to get affected, who I was, by the circumstances around me. You see, not long before, um, I watched a, uh, a programme on the television, a documentary by a name, man named Levison Wood. He was walking the Nile, and uh, during one part of the Nile, he had uh, been joined by a man named Matt Power from the US, who was going to write about this section uh, of Levison's journey. Two hours after they walked into the American wilderness of northern Uganda. The temperature started to soar into the mid-40s, and Matt started to suffer from heat exhaustion. Two hours later, he was dead. And as Levison looked back on this moment, he held Matt in his arms, he said, and he said, I did everything I could. We all did, but it happened on my watch. Levison was from the army and uh, he was responsible for looking after a watch, a group of guys. And he said, I was responsible for this man and he died in my arms. And even though myself and Luke on our Pembrokeshire coast path, uh, where the heat was only in the mid 40s or the low 30s, not the mid 40s, we were in our own wilderness at the time. And as a dad, I was responsible for my son. It was my watch. And if you look into this psalm, I suppose we could say that David went through a bit of soul searching, a feeling of separation from God. We find David in his own wilderness. And at the start of the passage, where uh, before we even immerse ourselves into the verses, we're told physically he is in the desert of Judah. It's likely this refers to a time in David's life uh, when he's been pursued by Saul, uh, the current king of Israel. And he's hiding in, in the desert 
um, of Nagav, which is in the Hebron. And I don't know if anyone knew, know, know um, this is a desert. The average uh, rainfall is about 24 degrees. It's a real rocky, sandy, wilderness place. And in Jul June, July and August, the temperatures reach a steam in 48 degrees. Not sort of the place that you want to set up camp as you hide from King Saul. And yes, understandably, the physical geography <clears throat> and the, the climate of the area is having a profound effect on David's physical well-being. In verses 1, we get a sense of a dry and parched land, an extreme thirst. Verse 9 provides a picture of life on the edge. He is a hunted man. And his adversaries have one thing in mind, murder, and their target is David. But like myself and Luke on our coastal park adventures and Levison Wood during his wilderness expedition, David's circumstances in his own wilderness are having a profound effect on his spiritual side. One Bible translates verse 1 by saying, My soul thirsts for you, my body longs for you. Um, one thing I learned recently was that soul music um, comes from the African-American gospel music scene with a bit of blues and jazz thrown in. And soul music, for any of you who have heard it, is not based on the physical, but is often based on the emotional side. It opens up the window of someone's heart and lets them see and feel their very makeup, their fabric and their emotions. And in these passages, David is opening up the window of his heart. Psalms are often called songs, and I suppose you could call this David's soul song. His words are leaving nothing to the imagination. He wants nothing more to be in the presence of God. He is thirsting for him. He is seeking him. He is longing for him. Physically, yes, the land is dry and parched, but also spiritually, he is dry and parched. And also in this psalm, there's a sense of darkness. David's longing extends into the darkness of night. There is a sense of restlessness as his physical circumstances hold the peace of sleep at bay. And I know in my own life, the night sometimes holds greater darkness than the lack of light itself. The blackness of my concerns and fears appear more profound and oppressive. I feel more alone in the battles against temptations and concerns. While the rest of the world sleeps on, my friends and I suppose my family, my wife, who I would normally kick around my concerns and ideas as they sleep, the darkness in my soul appears to grow exponentially. So how does David resolve the situation? What satisfies the true longing of his soul and chases the physical and spiritual darkness away. Soul satisfaction. Towards the end of my walk with Luke, as we came uh, through and off the Pembroke Coast Path, we came into a little housing estate and there, as we entered the estate, was this little corner shop. And we were in a pretty sight. We were disabled, we were hot, we were miserable. Not a pleasant smell either. And we walked into the shop and there was one of these tall vertical Coca-Cola fridges with lots of cool drinks in. And I remember buying, um, I remember doing it vividly now, a little bottle of, of flavoured water. I think it was berry hinted water and a bottle of full fat sugared oasis drink. And we went and sat on the, uh, the curb outside in a bar and we drank our first bottle of water. Or Luke had something else, I'm not sure what. And bang, instantly, our thirsts were quenched. The thirst that had affected everything was quenched. Now, I knew a little bit later on that thirst would come back, uh, that it that didn't quench my thirst for a dirty, I suppose you could say. But what it did, it gave me that instant relief that affected not only my physical, but my emotional side as well. And as David searches for God in his wilderness moment, as he thirsts for him, he knows that he has a father who has his watch. Not the ticking type, but his life watch. Who has him in his hands, but he also knows he's not just a father, he's God. 
He's the God of the universe, the God of history. And he's got him. He's got his watch. And notice that the majority of this passage is in the present tense. You are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole body longs for you. I remember you. I think of you. You are my help. I sing. I cling. David, even though he's searching, knows that his father, unlike my first bottle of water that gave partial satisfaction to my first, is no doubt that God spiritually is the water of life that satisfies completely. The longing of his searching soul, his very makeup, who he is, the first for the wholeness and peace and joy can only be found David knows in the loving sanctuary of his father. One thing that struck me as I worked through the passage, as I looked at these 11 verses, is that real sense of searching and seeing, of past, present and future. A sense of light and dark, of dryness and a fully quenched thirst. As David reflects on his life's experience in a God who has his watch, he looks back to the sanctuary of God. Uh, and in the Bible, uh, a sanctuary is often a holy place that was sacred. But it's also a place of refuge and safety. And as David perhaps remembers that God is who he is, it helps in his, in his searching to see that he is in the hands of a God who is all-powerful. And that helps him in the present situation. It helps him to know that he is his refuge and place of safety. And though the darkness of the situation reaches into the night, in the light of his knowledge of who God is, it helps him to know that he is safe in the shadow of God, his Father, who has his watch. I think of you through the watches of night, he says. Because you are my help. I sing in the shadows of your wings. I cling to you. Your right hand upholds me. And as David's soul song is refreshed by the knowledge, it impacts his physical well-being. As he sees and remembers and reflects on his father's power and strength. That God is the water of life that fully satisfies. That he is his sanctuary. The darkness is lifted, the light comes in, and it points him towards the future. My lips will glorify you. No doubt, they will. I will praise you. No doubt, they will. I will be fully satisfied. My mouth will praise you. David knew that he had a father who was omnipotent. He knew that he understood who God was and that the knowledge of his power was a daily basis for confidence in him. So how does that work out in our lives? Well, sometimes God uses the wilderness times in our life to draw us closer to him. Take the, the last year's experience uh, of the Covid virus and more than a year as we lead into summertime. Before then I was a busy man in my life. I liked being busy. But sometimes that busyness filled my day so much so that I had a lack of yearning and searching and delighting in God. On the outside, I put on this persona of a man who was satisfied, who had a thirst quenched. But on the inside, I still had a spiritual thirst that I was letting by my lifestyle grow dry. And then my life changed as lives for many of us changed. I remember I was Skyping a Christian mate when my wife burst into the living room. You need to hang up and come and listen to this. Boris Johnson has imposed a lockdown from tomorrow. And the impact on me was instant. My work stopped. 
No longer could I freely meet the people I loved. Suddenly buying a toilet roll and trying to find some pasta became the biggest problem in our family lives. And I know that my problems were minor compared with others. Others who have lost loved ones. Others who have lost their incomes. Others who have been isolated in their homes for over a year. Who've been affected by the disease and the lasting effect of that disease itself. Lives turned upside down, back to front by a situation that was completely out of their control. But suddenly I had more time on my hands. More time than I'd had for years. More time to be still. No time to search and find and be satisfied by the only person who could truly satisfy my first, my Father God. I suppose my Father God, who had the watch of life itself and the world in his hands. And sometimes God out of his love for us refines us during times of trial and suffering. Maybe not through the pandemic, but maybe in your own personal circumstances in your lives. In the furnace of your own particular wilderness times, God is or has changing you. Like David in my own life experience, God in his sovereignty has used my life experience to help me to yearn more, to search more, to love more, to thirst more, and to be fully satisfied with my God. The writer John Piper reflects a little bit on this subject about refinement in our wilderness times. And he says this, he is a refiner's fire and that makes all the difference. A refiner's fire does not destroy indiscriminately like a forest fire. A refiner's fire does not consume completely like the fire of an incinerator. A refiner's fire refines. It purifies, it melts down the bar of silver or gold, separates out the impurities that ruins its value, burns them up and leaves the silver and gold intact. God is like a refiner's fire. And he goes on. He does say in the Bible, he is like a refiner's fire. And this is therefore not merely a word of warning, but of tremendous hope. The furnace of suffering and affliction in our lives. Is always for refinement. And never for destruction. And there is a wonderful example of this in the Bible. A whole book, I suppose, that shows the refinement in a man's life. Uh, it's the book of Job. Uh, the star of that book is the name of the book itself. The man of Job. And at the start of that book, we're told there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. Job was blameless and loaded. He was the sort of man that a prospective bride would love to take home to her parents. But as we journey through the book of Job, we find everything physically stripped away from him. His story is a true riches to rags story. All he had that was stripped away, his riches, his home, his family. And we start to see him in his own wilderness moment. We find and enter into the window of his soul. And his physical body longing for relief. But one thing that was not affected was his faith. Like David, his ultimate trust was in his father, God. As his life was turned upside down, inside out, back to front by the circumstances that were beyond his control, 
he knew and he knew more that he was in the hands of an omnipotent father God who was refining him through this dark period of his life. He knew that the furnace of affliction in his life was refining him, but never destroying him. And at the end of the book, and it's a, it's, it's a, it's a couple of verses or a verse I always love to hear. My ears are heard of you. He's talked about the time from before. My ears are heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Knowing God more, quenching his thirst fully and for eternity. Before we close, can I ask you a question? Job said he had heard of God and not seen him. Have you heard of God but not seen him, not really known him? as your father. As Levison would look back at his wilderness experience, as he traced the journey along the length of the Nile, he said, having a man die in your arms makes you question your life itself. Now, I'm not aware if Levison has a faith or not, but here is a man who in the darkest moment of his wilderness experience is searching his soul to find out what is the solution to life itself. What truly satisfies the soul? One well-known singer penned the lyrics, I can't get no satisfaction, but I try and I try and I try. Where does your satisfaction come from? Is it based on family or friends or riches or circumstances, many of which are wonderful things, but can't save you when you enter your own wilderness experience? I suppose the greatest, greatest wilderness experience is being separated from God for eternity, separated from God in this life, not to have the joy and the peace and the love and the satisfaction of life itself. The first for that quenched, the reason you were created. What are you thirsting for? Be honest with yourself this morning. Is this first being truly satisfied? Does your very makeup yearn for something that is not being satisfied by your life at the moment? When in David's life, it is clear, your love is better than life itself. The story of the Bible is clear. There is nothing more satisfying than the love of God in your life. If you're wondering how great that love is, then there is no greater place to look than the cross of Calvary. His son, Jesus, freely given as a gift for all of humanity so that the price of our sin could be fully satisfied. One writer said Jesus didn't want to die on the cross. He asked God if he could pass, if there wasn't some other way. But he went to the cross willingly because God's love was better than life itself. And he was willing to give up his life for you. Many people say, that faith is taking a leap into darkness. I think it's more than that. I don't think it's taking a leap into darkness, but taking a step out of darkness and into the light. In this psalm, we see David's wilderness experience, the darkness of the night, the darkness in his first, being chased away when he stepped into the light of the darkness, destroying love of God. Love that helps him to look to the present and the future. Total soul satisfaction. Today, God is saying to you, maybe even in your time of your own wilderness experience, this is how my much I love you. Look at the cross. Step out of the darkness into the light. Let your soul's desire 
and thirst be fully satisfied for the life-giving blood of my Son, Jesus Christ. You may have heard of me from afar, but now see me and know me as your Father through Jesus Christ. Let me have your watch because you can trust in me for life now and eternity. We're now going to share together uh, a time of uh, singing, reflecting a little bit on that psalm of David. We're going to sing, My Saviour, My God. And, and the opening words sort of encapsulate a little bit of our soul song as we sing to our Father God. I am not skilled to understand what God has willed, what God has planned. I only know at his right hand stands one who is my Saviour. 